Hello everyone and uh, welcome to Oslo Chess Festival and this uh, masterclass. I'm uh, Tarja Svensson and uh, we're here with John Bartholomew. Did I say that right? Bartholomew. Bartholomew. Correct. Yes. Uh, you're going to show us uh, a couple of games, uh, but maybe you can say a little bit about how you're doing in the tournament. Uh, I know you, you uh, lost uh, the previous round, unfortunately. Yes, uh, just about one hour yeah, ago. Yeah. How, uh, how, how are you dealing with that? Uh, so the situation was this was round nine that we just played, and I've been having a good tournament. Uh, this was probably a must-win game for a GM norm, and I had black against a Norwegian IM, uh, Benjamin Arvola, a very strong player. And it was very complicated. I was pushing for the win, uh, played a, a risky opening line to try to make something happen, and unfortunately I lost after a very long game, um, but I enjoyed the game a lot. It was... You know, if I if I wasn't so upset <laughs> internally right now, I would probably have more to say about it. But uh, I'm definitely still feeling it. But I, I'll get over it pretty fast. Because you ha you okay, you lost today, but you had a pretty good tournament still, and you were chasing your second grandmaster norm. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, now I think uh, your chances are uh, you don't have any chances for that anymore. Yeah. Uh, but how do you how do you like the tournament so far? Anyway? Oh, I've been having a yeah, great time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to use this opportunity to say thank you to Paul and the organizers of the Oslo Chess Festival. This was just a tournament I kind of ha happened upon randomly mm -hmm. when I was looking mm -hmm. for events mm -hmm. to play uh, this past summer. Mm -hmm. And this looked like a, a very good one. People seem to have good things to say about it, so I'm happy yeah. to uh, attend and play. Yeah. Uh, you already talked about your YouTube channel in the previous uh, interview with Kimia, but, uh, so, so you don't have to say anything about that, but... Uh, uh, you, I suppose you're going to show us a couple of games. What are you going to show us? Yeah, so I use some of the games that I played on my YouTube channel right. uh, to identify some common themes that I think are especially, especially applicable to class players. So players below r roughly 2,200, which I think most everyone in this room probably qualifies, although I don't know your, your rating, Tarjai. I'm, I'm around 2,100, but I'm still... Uh, okay, I'm you're, falling, you're right in there. I'm falling, so yeah. And honestly, <laughs> these things apply regardless of your rating. Yeah. Um, so, yes, these are all examples, except for maybe one example, um, that I've played on my YouTube channel. And these tend to be 15-minute games that I played and recorded. There's actually videos for every single one of these games that I've played. So if you're truly interested in uh, learning more about my thought process, then you can go and look at those videos, too. Did you get any content for your videos in this tournament? That you probably. Are to use? Yeah. yeah, probably. Uh, I've been... A little hesitant to post analysis of my games in GM norm tournaments just because I know my opponents watch my videos <laughs> to prepare. That's kind of the reality of having a chess YouTube channel. Is, that, is that a problem you had in, in previous tournaments that they actually watch your videos and prepare? Yeah, watch that's, your videos? that's happened. And yeah. some opponents have told me that, actually. Uh -huh. uh, so the only solution I found is to be um, a little, play it a little closer to the vest and not post 100% of your thoughts and especially things in terms of opening preparation. Right, right. Okay, so what are you going to show us? Can you, you can start with a game. Okay, so yeah. we're going to start with a bit of a warm-up here, calculation warm-up. And all right, it jumped right to the position. This is good. Okay, so as I said, these were 15-minute games that I played online, and I think this fits the, the format nicely because we got about an hour today. And this first one is just a, a calculation problem. I'm going to give you a line and ask you to visualize this line. And come to a conclusion about the resulting play. Okay, so this is black to move, and in this position I was calculating bishop takes knight on f3, bishop takes f3, knight takes e5, and then bishop takes d5. Okay, I'll go over that line one more time. Bishop takes f3, bishop takes f3, knight takes e5, bishop takes d5. So two-part question, what do you think of that line? And the more important part, how should the game go after that? Interesting. And this is the position you should think for four minutes. Yes, you're probably. Given, you're given four minutes for, for this, this position. Yeah, this no. was just the default on chess space. Okay, okay. So if someone comes up with a line uh, faster than that, which I think they probably will. <laughs> Any suggestions? 
Yes? Yes, what's your name? Uh, rook takes uh, d5. Okay. Queen takes rook d8. Okay. Can we take that line a bit further? So after rook d8, what will white play? Queen, okay. Queen can go to a2, and then bishop isn't hanging. Right. So white can try to defend the bishop. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you can take the bishop after queen d2 or queen d2, and if you capture back the piece, uh, mm -hmm. rook, you have a check on f3. Very good. I see it. Right. Who saw that line <laughs> in its entirety? Raise your arm. Okay, so we got two who saw that line all the way through. They are pretty strong players as well. <laughs> yes, yeah, I was talking to those guys yeah. a bit earlier in the tournament. Um, so I wanted to start with this one because, you know, A, this is a good visualization practice, mm. um, being able to see a line like that in your head. Mm. And B, I wanted to highlight what uh, something I'll be talking a, a bit about in this lecture. My opponent played this line way too fast. So when I took on F3... They took back right away, which is fine, because that's mm. the only move. But after knight takes e5, they took on d5 with hardly any hesitation. Under 10 seconds, that move was played in. And, okay, this is a rapid game, 15 minutes per side. But still, that's a very risky move, committal move to play in 10 seconds, unless you think you've seen everything. Um, so let's see this now. At what point did you see this line? Did you see it early on? I saw it on the previous move, right. uh, in fact, when I played this, uh, this bishop centralizing. Um, so here's the... Solution, so take, take, knight takes pawn. And now white should retreat the bishop probably, although the position's pretty nice for black. I can stick a knight on uh, the c4 square, for instance. It looks very comfortable up. for black here. Yeah, yeah, yeah white's dark Got square it. bishop is a huge problem. Yeah. So, again, yeah, he took this pawn, and after take, take, rook d8, now we've got this skewer on the d file. And regardless of whether the queen goes to g2 or a2 to defend the bishop, the, the tactic will be the same. Uh, he chose a2. I guess I even have an extra option with knight f3 check here. But uh, this attraction sacrifice will be uh, played regardless. And, of course, the point is if, oops, if white takes, then you get the nice royal fork winning the queen. Beautiful. And the other reason I'm, I'm posing this question to you, like giving you a line to look at, is I strongly believe that when you're practicing your calculation and visualization, you should treat it just like a tournament game. Okay, so if you're working through a puzzle book or um, any sort of calculation problem, try to treat it like a tournament game. Visualize the solution as much as possible in your head before playing out the moves. Okay, any questions on this one? All right, I so... I think you answered them already. Yes. Now, the first major theme we're going to talk about um, is somewhat correlated to the last example. We're going to talk about weak or undefended pieces. And for those of you who watch my channel, you'll know that I just harp on this constantly because I would say this is the number one mistake that I see amateur players making is that they routinely have way too many pieces on pre, just outright hanging in the course of a game. Whereas when you look at grandmaster games, games of strong players, uh, they're very good about keeping their pieces and pawns defended. It's, it's hard to identify moments in games where they truly let that go because they know that that will just come back to bite them so quickly. So let's look at our initial example here. Okay, so this is a position where my opponent's last move was pawn to e4 from e3. And when I saw this move, I was attracted to something. But I don't want to give too many hints. So black to play, what should, what should black do? Looks like you're attacking. <laughs> yeah, or maybe he's trying to attack me in the oh, center. Oh, that's true, also. Maybe. Yeah. And by the way, if you're too timid to raise your hand and suggest what you think is a solution. You can also comment on general things in the position, things that stick out to you. This is a pretty casual setting, so yes. Yes, right. So anytime your opponent plays a move, you should consider the implications of that move, right? Uh, especially if that move leaves something undefended, a piece or a pawn or even a square. 
So I like that you pointed out that the d4 pawn is suddenly undefended. White just played e4 here. Also. Correct, yeah. yep. Looks like it's a Dutch defense, is it? I no. actually played it was oh, in English. It's, it's English. English with yeah. F5. You're right. Sometimes it's hard to remember these games because right. uh, this one was played two plus years ago. Yes. Very good. Excellent. Very good suggestion. What's your name? Louis. And Louis is eight years old. He's one of our most talented kids, actually. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, great to hear. You nailed it. So knight g4. Uh, what's the point of that move? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. So it's a double attack. Yeah, one of the strongest devices in chess, right? The double attack. Uh, my very first chess coach told me that, and that's always stuck in my head because it just makes perfect logical sense. If you attack two or more things and your opponent can only respond with one move, then chances are you're probably winning something most of the time. Uh, so knight g4. And, yeah, he evidently just missed that this was um, a hit on both of those, those points. If it was just one threat, then white could deal with it, but here there's no effective way to deal with uh, the fork and the attack on the d4 pawn. And I believe he saw the attack on d4 but missed the fork because he played knight b3 and knight e3. And then I just went up the exchange and, and went on to win. So, very good. Um, as far as move selection goes, I was mentioning how you want to consider the implications of your opponent's last move at all times, and that can drive your candidate moves, the moves that just initially come to mind, right? So certainly, if you see some sort of weakness in your opponent's position that was just created, you will try to, to pounce on that and take advantage. Uh, and I don't think any other move works. I mean, we would consider taking on e4 either way, either with uh, the, the pawn or the knight. But the problem with those moves, if we're still trying to get at the d4 square, is that white can take with the, the d knight, right? and then the queen comes into contact with the d4 pawn and defends. Any questions on this one? Okay, let's try another one. Okay. I believe I was talking about this idea uh, with Jonas recently, so no pressure, Jonas. You'll <laughs> we'll see how good your memory is. Um, so this comes from a queen's gambit. Queen's gambit declined. And black's last move was pawn from b7 to b6. And how should white respond? I see some tricks in this position, actually. Uh huh. I'll keep it silent. That's this is a good idea to have in your, your mental arsenal. Yes, back here. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Good. Yeah, Louis, do you have the same thing? Yeah, very good. Mm. Uh, who has seen this idea before, even this exact position? Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of typical, uh, typical idea, but it's still good to know. It's yes. An idea that is important to know. It's, impor it's possible to forget it. So just repeating all this type of position helps you memorize next time it can happen. Yeah, definitely. So the position we had prior was this. Uh, what's funny is I believe this was an opponent who I played twice, and on both occasions, we got into this position, and they played b6 both times. So I guess he didn't learn from his mistake, and I think I was commenting on that in, in the b6, second video. b6 is actually a dangerous move to make in many positions because mm -hmm. of this uh, line in, in the diagonal. Uh, right. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Uh, so after b6, we eliminate the knight, takes, takes, with the point being that after queen h5, you get the double attack. So the attack on h7, threatening mate, that's the bigger threat, but also the double attack here. So black will lose a pawn. Uh, say g6, queen takes d5. This is basically winning for white. Right. Yeah. yeah. So therefore, if you play these structures as black, you probably know that typically black puts the pawn on c6, which reinforces d5. Mm. It's a lot more uh, sturdy of a defense. Okay, moving along. Uh, I don't want to show exclusively examples where um, I was the one who had the better position and came out on top. Uh, so <laughs> had to throw in one of these, too. 
So this was a, a very strong opponent that I was playing. These, these ratings are not accurate, by the way. They're you know, just online ratings. So my last move here, I was playing black. My last move was rook from a8 to a3. And how should white reply? This is one where it's, it's a lot easier in puzzle form as opposed to this, during yeah. the game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jonas. Yeah, taking on d5. Everyone see that move? <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is a move you should see within five seconds if you're uh, like, I think, 1800 maybe? 1600, 1800? If you're yeah. prompted, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Of course, it's much easier when you have the position. And exactly. You see it, like, you know it's a, it's a puzzle. You know it's, uh, in this position, it's a good move. Mm -hmm. It's uh, more difficult to find it in a normal game, of course. Yeah, so we had uh, the position here. And the game had been balanced up till this point. And I felt like my last move was, when I played it, it was a good move yeah. because here white's threatening knight takes g5. Yeah. My pawn on g5's double attack. I thought, okay, let's just pin the knight, which is going to slow white's counterplay down. Um, however, I didn't stop to think that I have multiple undefended pieces here, right? So queen on d7, uh, bishop on f6, and now the rook on a3 that I've just made undefended. And knight takes d5 just beautifully takes advantage of all three of those. And I saw it right after I moved. Um, and of course, for those of you who are curious, that the point is if, whoops, if black takes the queen, then you get this fork on f6 check. King moves, takes, and white's simply up a piece. So I was sitting there praying that my opponent doesn't play knight takes d5. Uh, if white did play knight takes d5, I think I was planning to play queen takes, queen takes a3, and now something like knight d8. Maybe try to reroute this knight into f4 and, and look for counterplay. Uh, should just be lost, but that was my, my backup plan if they did play that. But instead, he missed it too. So he played queen c1, and the game went on. So even good players like have to be constantly reminded of this. This is why I wanted to lead, lead with this topic, because recognizing undefended pieces is just critical to your chess success. If you let your guard down, you're going to run into stuff like this. Nice. So keep those pieces and pawns protected. Uh, next topic I wanted to talk about, applicable to, again, pretty much all players, but especially amateur players. I want to talk about autopilot moves, because I see a lot of this. So moves that are played just on instinct, uh, often you've read in a book, or maybe people have told you that such moves are good, or uh, maybe you've seen from some games that such moves are usually played. And I'm not suggesting that you should avoid autopilot moves entirely, because, of course, we all occasionally play these moves. But... Um, when you're going over your games, be critical of moves that look normal, but in fact give away the advantage. Can anyone think of a, a typical autopilot move type of move? Okay. Mm -hmm. So pawn pushes. Yeah. Right. And it's tough. Obviously, in a competitive game, you need to make decisions based on the clock. Uh, so sometimes playing a move that looks normal and you can play it quickly is an acceptable strategy. Uh, but again, any other types of autopilot moves? Jonas? Yeah. Yep, exactly. And this is the, the first example that I was going to show. So a rook move to the center is a very typical autopilot move that people make. Uh, in fact, there was a, uh, a master from my home state in the U.S. Who, uh, who told me one time, he's like, he pulled me aside, he said, John, you make too many autopilot rook moves, and you especially like centralize your rook moves because you know that generally those are okay to play, but uh, I think you're giving away some advantages in doing that. And that was a very insightful comment, and I've always kind of remembered that uh, and tried to, to be on the lookout for that. So here's a game where I was on the black side of a Sicilian. I'll just go 
back to the opening. So it was a Moscow variation, bishop b5 check. I decided to play knight d7. And white developed rapidly, so the queen coming out, but I don't have a knight I can put on c6 to attack it. And white very quickly developed and castled queenside. And here I think I played uh, just a, a lackadaisical move. Bishop c6, not the best. And you can probably guess what white played. I think I know what I would make in this position. I'm not sure if it's okay. Really there, you know? What do we think white played, given that I'm showing this example? <laughs> yes, rook h e1. And again, white played it almost immediately. There was hardly any thought. I mean, it can't be a terrible move, right? It makes a lot of sense. The rook is the one piece that's not participating. But I was very pleased to see that move because I felt like that would give me enough time to uh, develop my bishop and castle. Uh, can I ask something in this position? Yes. Uh, is e5 tempting here? Mm -hmm. Can you play e5? Yeah, exactly. I think e5 is strong, and I think that's going to put black on their back foot very quickly. Right. That's what I thought. It looks, looks natural. Uh, right. Don't hesitate to yeah, open yeah, the yeah, position. Of course, of course. Yeah. And after takes, uh, queen takes, you can already see the deficiencies with black's underdeveloped uh, position. The queen's under attack. The knight is double attacked on f6. So... I'd probably ah, have to play horrible. this extremely yeah, this pathetic move. Yeah, this is horrible. Yeah, and white has a huge initiative here. Instead, though, rook h e1, bishop e7, and that buys me just enough time ah. to ensure the future safety of my, of my king. So he now played e5, but after take, uh, queen takes e5 here is just a lot less effective, right? I think I can play. You just move, move the, the, the queen. Yeah, queen b6 anyway, should yeah. be fine, maybe queen b8 even. And you get to castle in the next move. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, he instead traded queens, but I'm very happy to play an endgame. Those of you who played the Sicilian might know that a lot of the endgames, especially in the open Sicilian, are just better for black, or black has nothing to fear. And I even picked up a pawn very soon. So white missed that moment, that window of time, because they played an autopilot move. Uh, this is why chess is tough, right? Because you can... You can sometimes play moves that, according to the book, should be good, but in the position, in the moment, are, are bad. So here, the fact that I'm underdeveloped, that overrides any uh, general uh, concerns about centralizing a rook. Questions on this one? Okay. Next, I want to show you a game that illustrates uh, not only autopilot moves, but also playing without a plan. Okay, because... Playing without a plan, I, I should probably even make that a separate uh, mini theme here, but that's one of the most dangerous things you can do to your, your own game. Uh, just playing thoughtless chess, kind of moving your pieces in the general direction that you think they should go, but not having an overall game plan. And I see this just time and time again, and it always bothers me when I, I see students playing like this or, or other players because... Uh, you know, I don't want to go so far as to say that a bad plan is better than no plan at all in chess, but especially after castling, after both sides have castled and secured their kings, it's just imperative that you have some sort of game plan. Whether it's a side of the board that you're going to play on, a maneuver, um, repositioning a poorly placed piece, you've got to have something to work with. If you're just reacting to what your opponent's doing and throwing pieces in a general direction, you're not going to be, become a good chess player. So... I'm really going to pick on my opponent here, but you know, these are anonymous internet games, so Sharky123, <laughs> I, I apologize in advance. Okay, so I was black in this game, and there's a big rating mismatch in this one, uh, as happens with a lot of my online games. So you shouldn't look at these games just because I'm winning many of these, like, oh, John is such a good player. Like, no, uh -huh. so <laughs> that's the reality of playing online. So my opponent plays a C3 Sicilian line, kind of mixing the C3 Sicilian and the open Sicilian. So well-known trap here. What happens if black takes on e4? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So good one to know. We're not forgetting our first theme, right? Undefended pieces. Don't fall for this fork. So after h3, I just played a developing move, knight c6. Now knight takes e4 could be a threat. My opponent played d4. I took. He took. Now, in this position, I believe knight takes e4 is the best move for black because um, after knight takes e4, d5, black does have to be careful because, again, if we move the knight, queen a4 check is going to be an issue. 
But I think there's some theory starting with queen a5. And it gets very sharp, and uh, I honestly don't really know the theoretical evaluation. Probably it's equal. That's usually a safe bet. Mm. <laughs> um, but I didn't want to go in for that. So after the trade on d4, I decided to play d5 and strike back in the center just to try to disturb this pawn duo. You know, if your opponent has pawns on e4, d4, typically you've got you to gotta fight back against that somehow or seek counterplay elsewhere. So I decided to, to strike back in the center. My opponent advanced e5. I jump in. Knight c3, we trade. Okay, bishop f5. I'm trying to get my bishop outside of the pawn chain before I play e6. Don't want it locked in. Bishop d3. So far, so normal. We get a trade. e6, white castles. Bishop e7. Okay, so let's pause here for a moment. Uh... I think there might have been uh, a stronger way for white to play a couple moves ago, but for the most part, I'm, I'm okay with the way Sharky 1, 2, 3 is handling this position. But now, after white has castled, I think we need to assess and try to come up with a plan for white. So think about it a minute, and we'll get a suggestion or two. This would probably be good if you had his uh, light squared bishop on uh, d3. It mm. would be good for white. Attacking potential? Yeah, a little bit like French type of structure, I guess. But now I guess it's it's a much better version for you. Right. Could be like a yeah, good French or Carol Khan. Yeah, exactly. I'll call on you in just a second, give people a little more time to think about it. And in fact I should flip this around. Let's look at it from White's point of view. Paul's nodding like he knows what, what he's going to do here. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, what would you do? I like it. That's a good plan, actually. That's what's what I thought. I, I pr Probably I wouldn't play Knight H2, but maybe... You play knight d2, would that be completely stupid? No, no, I think you could make a case for knight d2 or knight h2. Um, did anyone else have that same plan in mind? Move the knight and push the f-pawn? Okay. So, so why are we playing on the king side? To attack. Okay, and what about the position would like indicate to you as a 2100 player that you would want to play on the king side as opposed to the queen side? Because or? likely... Black is going to castle on the king side. Yeah, yeah, I think both those factors are important, uh, especially the the point about the pawn chain. So we probably all heard that rule that your pawn chain generally points right. to the side of the board that you want to play. Uh, white has more space in that direction. Uh, also, if we look at the queen side, white is not better on the queen side. Well, the center is blocked, so it's hard to play in the center. But the queen side, uh, black is better because white has this backward c pawn that is for the moment having a hard time advancing. Even if white does advance, then the d-pawn could be weak after a trade on c4. So white's chances in this position, I think, definitely lie on the king side. And moving the knight and pushing f4 is the best way to start trying to uh, coordinate on that wing and create some problems for black over there. And also, black is not able to castle uh, queen side here because you have an open b-file, which would be dangerous for him, right. I guess. Yeah, I remember during the game I wasn't really thinking about castling queenside, I think, for that reason. All right, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. That is why white can already start an attack on the king side because mm -hmm. it's, it have to move the king somewhere, and it's likely going to be on the king side. Right, right. So, yep, I think I move, like, let's say, knight d2, and yeah. after castles, f4, right. black already has to think about the impending f5. Is exactly. black going to allow that? Is black going to try to play defense? g6, maybe make a weakening move. Maybe eventually you can play... G4 and F5? Yeah. So the point is, White has a game plan. 
an area of the board that they can begin directing their forces to and using the pawns to try to create weaknesses. Uh, white is thinking uh, in terms of multiple moves and, and coordination rather than individual move operations. If you're always thinking of individual move operations, again, you're probably not going to become a strong player because uh, you always need to coordinate in chess. So instead, though, uh, I guess I'll continue showing this from the white side. Sharky played a move that looks reasonable. Like if you just glanced at this position and weren't thinking so much in terms of plans, you'd be like, okay, like I can see why you would play such a move. Bishop e3, connecting the rooks, developing the last minor piece. But after castles, I remember thinking and commenting that white really needs to get going with their kingside play. If not on the last move, definitely this move. Because I'm ready to start playing on the queen side and trying to exploit this weak c3 pawn. I mean, if I get the chance, I'm going to go rook c8, queen c7, knight a5, hammer the c pawn, maybe jump my knight into c4. White could easily be defending before their attack gets off the ground. And you can probably guess what happened. Uh, maybe not in terms of specific moves, but just the overall direction of this game. So Sharky plays, again, a move that looks reasonable. Rook a, b1, activating the rook with tempo, attacking the pawn on b7. But I don't like this move because b6 or knight a5 is a move I'd like to play anyways to continue going with my queenside play. And the overall trend of white's play is just not in the direction where it should be on the king side. So I played knight a5, defending the b pawn and opening the c file. And I think this is probably the last chance, uh, or after knight d2, which is a reasonable move, because, again, it, it uh, allows the f-pawn to move forward and also covers c4. But after rook c8, I think this is the real last chance for white to demonstrate that they're thinking in terms of a plan. So f4, like, has to be played here. I think if you don't play f4, you're, you're really going to be struggling. Can anyone predict what he played? Yeah, very good. Yep, rook fc1. So just another kind of thoughtless move. Like, it's not going to lose the game, but it's just the overall trend of the moves that white is playing is, is negative for white. Uh, that's totally the wrong plan. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. yeah, exactly. White's not creating any problems for me. He's trying to defend on the side of the board where strategically, statically, he's simply worse. That's usually not a good strategy in chess. Usually you've got to seek your counterplay on another side of the board where you could claim to be better. This is kind of a typical move that a weaker player would make in such a uh, position, I think. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And that's why I singled out this game because, again, like not trying to hammer on this player, but I can see ma many elements of, of typical play, uh, third, fourth-rate moves that on their own don't lose the game, but if you play these types of moves, you're going to get bad positions. Yeah. So queen c7. Let's flip this back around because the damage has been done at this point for white. Uh, queen b5, this move doesn't threaten anything. I guess optically it looks decent, but I just played b6. There's no pawn breaks I have to worry about on the queen side. Now my plan was simply to play knight c4, and all the end games are better for black thanks to that backward c3 pawn. Black has the better bishop too. So now Sharky123 played f4 finally. But it's just too little too late. White's directed all their pieces to the queen side. I'm not at all concerned about a king side attack now. So knight c4. You trade. Black's play is just flowing very easily. G4, but again, this is not No, it's too late already. Us. It should have right. been done much earlier. Yep, exactly. Queens are off the board. Yeah. I'm not going to get yeah, checkmated yeah. here. Yeah. Just simply bring the rook over, attack. Bishop d2. So uh, I think the position is still semi-defendable for white. Like, white is clearly worse here, but it's not over yet. Uh, but I guess it's a very comfortable position to have against a weaker player because there's this long, this long strategy here to, to press on the C3 pawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, a little bit of a, an inside secret. So title players love to win games like this against lower-rated players. Just play safe positions, uh, limit their counterplay, they as in the lower-rated players, and wait for you to make a mistake. That, that's how I beat so many lower-rated players. I've seen people use that strategy time and time again. Uh, your, your best strategy in playing against a higher-rated opponent is to go for dynamic positions, sometimes sharper positions than you might go for. You don't want to get ground down strategically like this and have no play. 
you get no points for taking 40 moves to lose, right? This is like a bit like typical Magnus type of position. Ah. He would like <laughs> like against a, a, a player, a strong player, actually. A, a slightly weaker player. Like he a 2750 Yeah, 2750, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right. So remember that if you're ever being paired up in rating, I know several of you have in this tournament, or if you're playing a simul against someone. You know, when I play a simul, the games that worry me the most are not games where my opponents play safe moves, don't hang anything, because I know I'm going to win those eventually. It might take me like 40, 50, 60 moves, but I'm going to win them. The games that really worry me are the ones where they just go for it. They show <laughs> no fear. They don't respect me. They just go for my king right away, right away and try to make it crazy. So here I played rook a4. Uh, you guys might be familiar with the, the principle of two weaknesses, which says that it's difficult to win a chess game based on one weakness alone, like attacking one point in your, position, uh, your opponent's position. So I, I felt like I wasn't going to win just by attacking c3. Like, yeah, it's a weakness, but white can defend it many times. But if I pivot and start attacking other weaknesses, that might create some real problems for them. Uh, now here, white has only one move to stay in the game. What is that move? Louis. That's what white played, but unfortunately that's a mistake. That runs into bishop a3. <laughs> bishop a3 is a big problem yeah. here. It's always easy to blunder in bad positions, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I was yeah, so by process of elimination, what does white have to play here? It's not pretty, but... Yeah, rook a1 <laughs> has to be played. I mean, it's... It's a really ugly move to make in yeah. this kind of position. Yeah, and... Such a passive move. It's not nice. And black has many ways that they can try to further increase the pressure. But yeah, rook a1 is the only way to avoid immediate tactics that lose another pawn for white or the exchange. But yeah, instead they played rook c2, and after rook takes d4, I won a very valuable pawn. Yeah, the game is, this is pretty much over here. Yeah, essentially yeah. over. Yeah. Take, take. Yeah, and how maybe he thought he had some back rank check, but I easily cover, and yeah. you know, the game is over. Nice. So... Yeah, I wanted to go through this game in its entirety because there's not many moves other than this rook c2 move at the very end that we can pinpoint that just outright loss for white, but it's the overall trend. Like, if you catch yourself playing this way, you have to stop yourself in a reverse course or try to find some better plan. Don't just play thoughtless moves and try to string them together and pass it off as a plan. That's, that's not going to work. So I mentioned that after you've castled or after both sides have castled, that's a useful moment to take stock and try to anticipate uh, what your plan should be, because then you know the position of the kings. You know what sides of the board are going to be advantageous for you or dangerous for you to play on. That, then it's really time to formulate a plan. And don't worry so much if it turns out to be the wrong plan. If you're thinking in terms of plans, that's already good. Okay. So thank you to Sharky123, wherever you are, for <laughs> this material. Again, don't mean to, to, to badger you and <laughs> pile on, but it was an instructive game. Does anyone have any questions about this game? Okay, we're cruising here. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. It's kind of more of the same. Uh, let's talk about time management again. I briefly touched on this at the beginning. Now, I have to say, I have pretty awful time management myself. That's the number one thing I'm trying to improve on as a chess player, especially in pursuit of my, my grandmaster title, is getting my clock under control. But if you were to guess, for player, let's say we'll, we'll take a player, the average rating of uh, 1,500. Would you say that they play too fast or too slow? No, that's pretty broad. But <laughs> if you, if you had broad, to guess, yeah. would you say too fast or too slow? And I could be wrong about this, by the way, but this is just based on my experience. Ah, uh, okay, I like that. that, that I, I like that to say Yeah, well. I didn't yeah. specify the age. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it matters. It's actually a great importance. It really matters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say, in general, people play too fast. Um, not necessarily like a 1500, but a lot of people play too fast, True. especially online. True. I know online you can always make the excuse like, oh, it's just an online game, who cares? But uh, if you're using your on online games to train, then you should try to manage your time just like you would in a tournament game. People tend to be more impatient when they're playing online. They yeah. want to play faster games. It's really hard to, to play slowly in, in, a, in a long game online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll go with their first instinct. Yeah. And that has to be taken into account when we look at these examples, but... I'm going to show you some examples where 
kind of like that very first problem, my opponents made very committal decisions extremely quickly. And we'll use them as calculation practice too. Okay, so I gotta scroll to the move here. I don't think this is Jan Gustafsson in this game, Jan Soldier. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this was a 15 plus two game, 15 minutes with a two second increment. And at this moment, White had 14 minutes and 10 seconds remaining, and I had 11 minutes and three seconds. Now, White to move played a committal move, and again, it was played very quickly. And we can see the, the contours of the battle taking place. So I've got this strong knight on e4, decent pawn structure. It looks like White should be playing on the king side. Can anyone predict what white played? This is an aggressive looking move. It doesn't have a threat necessarily, but it looks like it could be of concern to black. Probably a couple moves that fit this description. Yes. Yeah, pretty close. So they played queen g4. And this was played in 26 seconds. Okay, not terrible time management. But what does this overlook? Louis? Yep, follow by after king h1. Right, winning the exchange. Or what's the alternative to bishop c5? That works virtually the same way. Queen b6, yeah. I chose queen b6 because I like the fact that after this, my queen gets to land kind of behind enemy lines. And that was pretty much that. I mean, you can see that white's bishop can't develop either. Extra exchange. It's going to go downhill quickly for white after this. So uh, maybe I was being a bit harsh uh, on this player too, because 26 seconds, okay, I've, we're going to look at a couple much worse examples here, but uh, still maybe a bit too quick and, and showing a lack of awareness of the, the long diagonal. That's probably the real issue. And black was threatening knight g3 here, so white needs to play some move to guard that and also think about playing bishop e3 at some what stage. What about just taking off this knight on e4? Yeah, certainly white could think about yeah. bishop takes e4 and yeah. then maybe bishop e3. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is probably a knight that will have to be dealt with right. at some point. It's so annoying, so why not chop it off? Yeah, exactly. Okay, another one here. If we had more time, we could go into examples of... Uh, you know, criticizing or critiquing each move in a game, like maybe even an OTB game, because uh, you should really look back at that, your time management, each and every move of a game, if you truly want to master uh, how to manage your clock. So let me flip this around. Okay, so this is kind of something instructive in the opening. Many of you, you guys are tournament players, you might know this, but in this position in the Queen's Gambit after knight f6, uh, can someone describe why this move is considered dubious? Just in general chess terms. You don't even have to cite any specific variations if you don't want to. Jonas. You're not defending the center of the pawn, so you're giving away center control and allowing a pawn to move. Right. So in the Queen's Gambit, white is trying to knock out black's D pawn with their C pawn. And typically, if black's going to defend it, they play E6 or C6, the Queen's Gambit declined or the Slav. Knight F6, while a developing move, and having the name of a, a very strong historic player, Frank Marshall, attached to it, uh, it's known to be dubious because after takes, regardless of how black takes, black doesn't have that base of operation in the center to uh, base their play around, their coming play. It's really hard to play without a, a pawn on D5 in these Queen's Gambit decline slob positions. Uh, so... Yeah, after queen takes d5, knight c3, it's pretty likely that white will just take complete control of the center. Here after queen a5, they're trying to frustrate white's attempts to play e4, but at you some point that move will probably come. You can't play e4 here. Right. <laughs> yeah, I can't play e4 here. Uh, oh, one other thing too. So after knight takes d5, I've had this position over the board before. Maybe you guys have had too as well, but um, it's tempting to play e4 immediately, but... After knight f6, there's actually some issues keeping this center pawn duo intact. Can you play e5 immediately? After e5, knight d5, 
I think we're now in a position from the Queen's Gambit accepted that is right. considered acceptable for black. Um, and if knight c3 is played, just to defend the pawn, what can black do? Yes. E5. E5, yeah, E5 is a good move. Striking back at the center, not letting these two pawns stick mm -hmm. around. We touched on this earlier. Mm -hmm. And after takes, queen takes d1. If white takes with the knight, you lose e4. And if king takes knight g4, double attack. Mm. Black will win back their pawn with a decent position. So that's why if you ever get in this position and you're a d4 player, you should play knight f3 first. I think this is strongest. Control that e5 square and try to continue with e4 thereafter. Okay, so black plays this slightly dubious opening. I do get to establish those pawns on e4, d4. Okay. Yeah, and here we go. So I took on a5. And again, this is a 15 plus 2 game. I was probably not managing my clock very well this game. I have 6 minutes 44 seconds left. Black has 13 minutes 21 seconds. So black to move. What move do we think that black played? This is a extremely risky move. Actually, just a losing move. Queen takes a5? Did not play queen takes a5. But you guys are thinking along the right lines. <laughs> okay. Bishop takes a3 yeah. is what I was about to say, yes. And what will bishop takes a3 run into? The million dollar question. <laughs> Yes, you. Yeah. So you're going to play which move? Okay, just making sure, yep. Knight b5, exactly. So then the, the pressure down the c file helps us to win a piece, right? And notice that the bishop on d2 is defending the a5 pawn, so black can't play queen takes a5. Yeah, we're just going to win material. And what did I say here? So bishop takes a3. That was played in 10 seconds. Black has 13 minutes, 21 seconds. Black has a 2,000-plus online rating for this time control. They played that move very quickly. I think you had a very impatient opponent. Yeah, yep. And that happens a lot. Hmm. It's probably exaggerated because, again, these are online games. But uh, you can't play such moves, even if those moves work. Like, you can't play them that fast and think that you've calculated all the tactical consequences. Probably you would have seen it if you spent just 10 more seconds. You would have seen that yeah. you can't make that move, yeah. Yeah. Five, ten more seconds, and yeah, yeah he's, it's probably something he can spot. Because maybe he saw that taking on a5 is going to run into knight d5 tricks, right? Like one line I think I calculated when I played b takes a5 is, if queen takes, what will white do? Give the entire line. So let's continue that. Knight d5, queen d8, defending the bishop. Louis? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Queen takes e7. Right. Yeah. Yep. So that's that's me doing my due diligence when I'm playing b takes a5. You can show that line, maybe. Yes. I'm not playing that move just because I see that knight d5 is going to be played. You have to see that entire sequence, right, if you really want to make a move like b takes a5 work. So, yeah, queen takes, knight here, discovered attack on the queen, also attacking the bishop. Queen d8, take, take, bishop b4 with the skewer. I guess black can play c5 here, but after pawn takes, this is sorry, hopeless. my chess base keeps skipping ahead sometimes, but yeah, this is looking bad, right, with c6 coming. So the more tactical the position, of course, the more time you have to use. Uh, the more volatile the situation, you're, you're probably going to want to spend more time to make sure you're not blundering something and you're calculating your lines properly. If the, the position is very static and stable, usually this is based on like king safety and pawn structure, then you might be able to make some quicker decisions. But, you know, it's, it's like a spectrum, right? Like the, the more complicated the position, the more time you probably got to spend in general. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give one more example. This one's sort of funny. This is from an OTB game. I've decided to hide my opponent's name because... You know, I don't want to call them out or anything. <laughs> but uh, this was an interesting one just because of the, the time situation. So this was played in a, a tournament, a five-round tournament. These were pretty quick games. I think they were game in 60, 60 minutes with five-second delay. I understand you guys don't really play delay in Europe, right? No, it's, it's pretty much it's always very familiar for us. Yeah. yeah. 
I'm not uh, a huge how do you like that time control? I like increment much better, yeah. personally, because yeah. delay, usually if there's a delay, it's, it's five seconds, and you get into right. some crazy situations where you don't have time to write down the moves. Uh, and it's b basically permanent. You can't collect time exactly. like you can with increment. Yep. So you end up playing lots of endings just under severe, severe time duress. Uh, so this was game in 60 minutes with a five-second delay. And now my opponent, so they're rated right around 2,000. My opponent is uh, a player who plays very fast and often overconfidently. And I hadn't played him before, I don't believe, prior to this game, but I'd kind of seen him around at tournaments. And yeah, that was my read on him. He plays fast, overconfidently. So when he played knight e2, his knight was on c3, played knight e2, attacking my queen, I just had this strong sense that he wanted to play knight d4 on the next move. So if I move my queen, that's probably what he's going to do. Knight d4, just plant it right in front of that IQP. Because players who play fast, they usually just adhere to general concepts. And you guys might know that if there's, you're fighting against a, an isolated pawn, you usually want to try to blockade it. So with that piece of information in mind, where should I move my queen and why? And you'll need some calculation to back this up. You don't have that many moves to move the queen either. Right, yeah. There are like <laughs> not many moves to where you... You're deciding uh, between yeah. two moves. Yeah. Queen d6 and queen e7. We'll assume knight c4 doesn't work here. I'll call on you in just a minute. Just want to give people a little more time. Okay, let's hear your line. Uh huh, interesting. Okay, so in that line after queen f4, what if white plays queen b4? <laughs> <laughs> I think that covers. But I like that idea that you had mentioned with bishop takes h3. Uh, can I say uh, suggest a move? Mm -hmm. What about queen e7? Okay, knight d4. Then taking, mm -hmm. and then queen h4. Is that queen a possibility? H4. So then I have knight f3 at the end, right? Ah, then you have knight h3. Okay, queen h5. Then you're threatening to take on h3. Next Probably move. gives him a chance to defend, maybe bishop e2. Ah, it's simple. Ah, it's yeah. that simple, yeah. So that doesn't work then. It's a simple defense. Hmm. And by the way, according to the engine, there's not much of a difference between these two moves. Uh, but if we have a strong suspicion white's going to play knight d4, then there is a difference.
maybe like the floor. Let me just get those sleeves so I can still get the sleeves. Okay. So now it's burnt. Mm-hmm. And it is deeper than before. Let me just get those sleeves. I can take this sleeve to the side stuff and go to the one person on the right and ask them. Very nice. So what have you won in the final analysis? Yep, yeah, just a pawn, very valuable pawn, but yeah, that's the right line. Who else saw that line? Excellent, good, I was hoping a few people would. Uh, and we're kind of putting the pieces together. I think you sense that it has something to do with bishop takes h3, just getting it in the right order. Um, so yeah, this is very interesting because there are sometimes occasions like this in a game where you just get this strong sense that your opponent's going to play a certain move and you can trap them based on that. You know, chess is not like poker, of course, like your reads are less important than the objective value of the moves. But here I thought there theoretically wasn't that much of a difference between queen d6 and queen e7, but if knight d4 is played, like queen e7 sets a trap. So that's what I played. So queen e7, and he like instantly played knight d4, hardly thought about it. it it's a logical move because black is threatening d4, but um, better to play knight f4, actually, to take my bishop under observation. So here... I took on d4. You can also play bishop takes h3 right away if you want to do this move order. So that's, computer says that's even better. But this is also good for black. So bishop takes d4, takes, and now takes. Now, he did something that you should never do. Uh, if you've been surprised in a tactical position or you've just blundered and both you and your opponent realize it, the worst thing you can do is move fast in reply. Uh, you can't really bluff your way out of bad positions in chess, right? Like, that, that doesn't tend to work. Uh, so he played his next move very quickly, even though I could tell that he was surprised by bishop takes h3. I mean, of course, like, he probably wouldn't play knight d4 if he had seen this. So can anyone guess what white played here? Yeah, bishop takes g6. Yeah, again, played with very little hesitation. That's a, a desperado move. So white's trying to open up queen takes h3 across the board. But that's a move, if you're going to play it, you probably got to spend at least a few minutes calculating that, if not longer. Because now, suddenly, there's multiple possibilities for both sides. Well, queen g5 looks tempting. No, wait a minute. It's hanging on h3. Yeah, so he's trying to play that, that okay, queen takes yeah, h3 yeah. move. Yeah. Uh, any suggestions about what black should do? Yes. Take on g2, yeah. And I should point out, this is something I had to calculate when deciding to go for this whole sequence, right? So when I played bishop takes h3, I did see bishop takes g6 in reply. That was one aspect of the calculation. And yes, bishop takes g2 is good. So continuing this desperado theme, trying to get as much material before we uh, take white's bishop. And now, if white plays king takes g2, I can take on g6, blacks up a pawn. Uh, also, white's king is more open than mine. If bishop takes f7 check, I was planning rook takes f7. And then if king takes on uh, g2, there's rook g7 check. And I thought with white's king being so exposed, they're not going to last very long. So again, this is kind of a fun little challenge. But what move do you think white played here? Continuing in the same overconfident way. Queen g3. Yes, very good. Queen g3. Yeah. Not a good move, but again, like it's consistent with how this player's been playing. Uh, and I do have to take a little care because the queen is lined up with my king. There's various discoveries. But they're not going to amount to much. So I thought about it a little bit. I can't remember, honestly, if I saw queen g3 back when I played that. I think I did, but I, this game was played a few years ago, so I can't say with 100% certainty. But I took on f1, and now even though white has various discoveries, a lot of them can be met with queen g5. Even king h8 should be sufficient. So anyone want to predict what white did again? He should resign. <laughs> yes. That's a pretty good uh, guess. Not what white played, but that's a pretty good guess. Knight f3? Not knight f3. No. 
I think White thought they had a combination here to win my queen, but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bishop takes f7, double check. Uh, I mean, I guess if I absolutely had to, I could just play king h8 here and still be winning. But after takes, I think their intention was rook c7, but I can deal with that with either knight d7 or even rook g8. I'm just up so much material at this point. Uh, so yeah, if this, either knight d7 to block or just probably the move I would have played, rook g8, just to emphasize the fact that white's going to run out of pieces. So... As often happens, this is the first moment where he stopped to think in this entire sequence. And but then it's already too late. It's already too late. And I talk about that constantly in my videos, especially when I'm playing the longer games. Just so, so often people, people think reactively rather than proactively. They spend all their time in positions that are already bad for them or already lost. That doesn't make any sense. Like Again, it's, it's hard to think your way out of a bad position in chess. Like You've got to prevent that from happening in the first place. So yeah, he, he played king takes f1, but... After rook a c8, just covering the c file, I'm up a rook, and, and he resigned. So I essentially won this game because my opponent played overconfidently and just did not manage their time well at all. They went in for a very tactical sequence, and when surprised and losing a pawn, they didn't slow down at all to adjust. They just continued trying to uh, almost like bluff their way out of it by playing flashy moves that just don't work. So clearly, don't play like that. Any questions on this example? And again, time management is a huge topic. We could go on and on about that, but uh, I just wanted to caution against playing too fast in general. Uh, I still haven't figured out the how to avoid playing too slowly part. I'll get back to you guys on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're not the only one there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple mini topics just before we wrap up. I want to talk about gaining space. This is just a OTB game I had. This is played at the London Chess Classic Open back in 2012. So I noticed that many players, many amateur players, are uncomfortable when the position is non-forcing, when you have lots of moves to choose between, and especially when there's no tactics. And in su such positions, I want to emphasize that it's totally okay to play slow, improving moves. Okay, like There's no rule in chess that says you have to play the most direct, forceful move at all times. Uh, in fact, if you look at the games of Magnus, like what does he do most of the time? To me, it seems like he's often just like slowly improving his position, and he only resorts to tactics when the position favors him. Often he does nothing, or it seems like he does nothing. Right. There are just small, small improvements. Yeah, small yeah. Improvements. Yes. Uh, and, and that's just a model for, for us all. I mean, of course, we can't all play like Magnus. Only he can. But uh, I want to tell you, don't feel like your position is getting worse, regressing, just because you're playing slower moves. Uh, in fact, especially in the end game, that's the golden rule, right? You're supposed to take your time, Capablanca's principle, don't hurry in the end game. So here, this is a very level position, almost completely symmetric. I'm playing down and rating. This guy's 2192 fide. Now, I could play a move like rookie 8 to contest the file, and we'd probably have some swaps. But this, move, this position struck me as one where I really have to take my time and just start you know, gradually trying to increase the advantage. Uh, so can anyone suggest a, a move or two for black? And I say increase the advantage. I don't think black's better here, but if I'm going to play for a win, I'm going to have to play certain types of moves. Push Harry. Shout out to the ginger GM, Simon <laughs> Williams. Uh, so yeah, you could play a move like h5. Or what other move could be played along the same lines? Yes? A5. a5, yeah, exactly. So I think those two moves are perfectly reasonable. Um, I didn't see a real compelling reason to play that rookie 8 move. I it's normal to try to contest the file. But uh, this struck me as a position where I should start gaining space on the flanks because there's not much going on in the center. So yeah, h5, a5, start encroaching on white's position. So I chose a5. And the added benefit of playing such a move is that it almost communicates to your opponent that uh, you understand the position and that you're not worried about like any of these short-term operations that they have. And surprisingly, that makes a lot of people nervous when you kind of demonstrate that, uh, like, okay, I know you don't have anything that can hurt me here, so I'm just going to play like some logical slower move. 
A lot of people overreact in that scenario. So I, th I think white should play a4, probably in reply, just kind of meet me on the queen side. Uh, instead, he played knight d2, and I saw no reason not to continue grabbing a little more space, so a4. He plays a3. And now I was happy because there's a slight imbalance. I've got a bit more space on the queen side. The pawn on b2 could be a long-term weakness. So now I played rook e8. Again, this was probably not strictly necessary even, but I, f I was happy with what I had achieved, ever so slight on the queen side. I thought, now, okay, now I can, I can contest the file. So trade, I take with the knight, because if I take with the queen, I lose the knight on d6. So here, b5. And white has a few issues to work out, because in the long run, that b2 pawn is always a headache. b2 is weaker than c6, especially since my knight is within range of c4 attacking that. Can you take on d6 here? Would that be a possibility? Yeah, in fact, I think that's probably white's best bet. I think that's yeah. because this knight on, on uh, would be very annoying on c4 or, or e4. Right. He might have been hesitant to create this imbalance, bishop versus knight, with pawns on both sides of the board. Right. b2 will still be weak. I'll still probably find ways to press him here, but mm. I agree. I mm. think he should play this. Mm. Instead, he tries to uh, maneuver his knight to the d3 square. But now queen f5, uh, what is black threatening? Knight takes b2, right. So white starts to experience some tactical issues. So he plays bishop c1, like again, overprotecting b2. Uh, now off the top of your head, what should black play here? Let's call on someone. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> No tactics yet. I would play something like bishop e7. Okay. Get it on d6, maybe. Anyone yeah, else? Maybe. Yeah, good. I mean, we can A5 continue A5. making like gradual improving moves. Uh, you know, we check for tactics, but again, there's there's nothing that's going to win the game immediately. So I think I played h5, if I recall. Yeah, h5. So just grab a little more space. And again, the psychological impact of that is it, it gives your opponent like chances to stew, you know, chances to maybe make a mistake in a non-forcing position, and you're just improving your setup. So he goes queen e2, king g7, queen e8 check might be annoying at some point, so let's just move the king up. And you can see that uh, structure-wise, white doesn't have corresponding space-gaining moves that they can make because black is already encroaching pretty far on white's position. So king f1. Now I played bishop g5. I thought this trade, even though white's bishop is kind of bad, I thought this trade would be helpful, because I do eventually still want to probe them on b2. So we get this swap. And now white plays f4, lashing out. Uh, understandable. I guess they didn't like my queen kind of peering into their position, but this is a weakening move, unfortunately. Queen f5, king g1. Already hard to suggest a move for white because trying to move the knight somewhere active might run into queen b1 check. Uh, the queen needs to stay defending the knight. The knight needs to defend the pawn. That's, that's another downside of moving the knight. It also weakens e3 when you play uh, f4, I guess. Yeah, yep. Because the f-pawn was uh, defending e3. Mm -hmm. So king here. And now I played queen e4. Point being, if white trades, the knight will move and I can win b2. White goes king f2. Now, let's try to find one more useful move. I mean, we can already start thinking about uh, Zugzwang themes. Five looks tempting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what would you play, Jonas? <laughs> yeah, king f6 is a good move. I think I played king f8. 
Uh, King f6 might even be a little bit better. But yeah, I felt like uh, giving the move back to white would be unpleasant for them. Because really, almost every move has a downside here. Like, white's very close to being in Zugzwang. So again, if they trade queens, we take with the d-pawn and uh, the knight has to move, giving up b2. Any pawn move, I think, is bad for white. If g3 is played, I can play queen h1. And in that case, it's maybe helpful that my king is covering some of the entry squares. Uh, h3 could always be met by h4, just cramping white further. None of the other pawn moves are working. Uh, if the king moves, we might get into e3 with the knight. So, yeah, there, there's hardly anything to do here for white. So he traded. But, yeah, unfortunately after this, for him, take, we get kind of a forcing sequence. But I circle back. Now I'm going to pick up the a3 pawn, and that a pawn is just too much to handle for white. He played d5. I just move my king over. No hurry to take that pawn. Yeah, and here he resigned. We had just made time control, and it's going to be impossible for him to stop my pawn soon. So in this game, I won because I was able to make gradual improving moves more effectively than my opponent, and that led to tactics. Because this position, I think, is just dead level. And the winner is the one who's going to be able to, uh, to demonstrate like the, the Magnus technique better a from here. A5 is a deep move. I face a deep move to, to make, I think. Yeah, at the same time, I think for a, a strong player, that's a very intuitive move. Right. Because they've seen so many examples like this. Sorry? Yeah, good question. So if A4 is played... I'd probably maybe consider h5, like we were saying. White can't play a f h4 because my bishop is covering that square. Uh, I'm trying to recall if I was thinking about anything specifically against this in the game. Maybe eventually I would consider b5. It would have to be played under the right circumstances, but it's something I consider. I would, I would probably start with h5. That's a good question, because as we were saying, later on it probably would have been smart for him to trade the bishop for the knight. Uh, here, I think he should try to keep the minor pieces on, not trade anything. A knight for knight trade would be good for white, because my knight is a bit more effective than white's knight, hopping into you know, c4 or maybe e4 or f5. But if white voluntarily made this trade, I would probably look at that as a, as a slight victory for me. Because that's one imbalance I can play off of. And uh, the bishop, if it ever gets behind enemy lines to attack these pawns in particular, could be, could be nice. Isn't queen and knight considered better than queen and bishop uh, in many positions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, obviously depends totally on the position. If it was more open, then mm. yeah, white would have a better, better case for queen and knight. Right. I guess I would characterize this as a semi-open position. I feel like black should be a bit better with the bishop versus the knight, but right. it's probably close to equal. Like if I add stockfish, uh, it's probably going to be almost dead level. Yeah, 0.00 yeah. <laughs> zero <dot> zero <laughs> even after that trade. It means the computer has no idea what's going on. <laughs> I actually wonder if after a5 what it's going to suggest. That does like taking on d6. Anything yeah. wrong with a4? I don't think so. And does it suggest a5 is a top move? This might not be the best position to use a computer, because again, there's like virtually no tactics. It's all long term. But to me, as a human, I am I, I, I'm pretty happy with uh, like the way it went, gaining space and, and gradually applying pressure. Any other questions on this one? OK. We're about out of time, but. One more example. I wanted to talk about tension, the concept of tension. So you often have situations in chess where, uh, especially with pawns, where pawns are attacking pawns. Now, for amateur players, they are often in too much of a hurry to clarify the situation and release the tension. OK, so amateur players are very uncomfortable with the concept of tension. They think, oh, if one, s one side is attacking another, and there's a clash. We have to resolve that as soon as possible because we, we can't handle any uncertainty. Uh, but good players, they often play off of that tension. So a common situation is uh, like a, if you think of like a Sicilian dragon 
where white has castled queen side, black is on the king side, and white is pushing Harry down the board, pushing the H pawn down the board to attack that pawn on G6. Th that will create tension between the two pawns. And at some moment, white wants to take and try to open the H file. Uh, so you should always be aware of tension and try to use it to your advantage, especially if you think your opponent is going to resolve it unfavorably. Uh, actually, this is not the one I wanted to look at. Let's look at this one. So I'm playing white here. Black's last move was bishop from c8 to a6. That attacks my pawn on c4. It's double attacked, bishop and pawn. So what are white's options here? What candidate moves would I consider? I think I was only considering maybe two, three moves at the very most. Mm -hmm. A3 or castles, okay. Anything else? Well, knight e5 maybe? Can you play knight d5 here? Knight e5? Interesting. I don't think I considered that move, but that's interesting. Is it? <laughs> if it's interesting, it's pro probably bad. I don't, I don't see a reason why it's bad. Uh, maybe queen c7 or something. I think c takes d5 we definitely have to consider, right? Pawn trade. b3 defending. Mm -hmm. That probably runs into, well, it could get complicated, but g5 followed by knight e4. Definitely have to be concerned about. Let's say we simplify this even further, and we're looking at just two moves. Castles or C takes D5? Which one do we think is better? This doesn't work so well when you guys know the theme, but... <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so castles is what I played, and I think it's definitely better than releasing the tension. Uh, What's your reason for that? Yeah, keep the tension. <laughs> um, so my thinking is that if black takes on c4, that will actually help me push through in the center and open the game by playing d5 after a trade on c4 if black starts with a bishop. And that's what happens. So I just castled. Useful move. I'm going to have to castle at some point here in the position. Black took. We trade. And this was the position I had in mind when castling. So after d5, black is under a great deal of pressure. I am down a pawn, so this is a pawn sacrifice. But takes, knight takes. Now we're threatening knight takes f6. Also might be threatening knight takes b4, or even queen takes c4. And now the floodgates are open. Uh, black has to be extremely careful here. I think in the game, yeah, he played g5. Understandable, because the, the pressure was... Pretty significant. I took on c4, and you can see these weak pieces that black has, like the knight on c6 is now attacked. Take, take, hitting the queen, queen c8, and now I took on g5, and if black takes back, they're going to get mated quickly. So this is just a small example, but uh, I've seen so many games where one side could just benefit by not overreacting when, especially pawns, like this happens a lot with pawns, when two pawns are attacking each other, think, do I have to release the tension right away or can I benefit from keeping the pawns as is for a while? Good rule of thumb, if it's never good for your opponent to take your pawn, then you should really choose your moment wisely to release the tension because having that option of either taking, pushing past, or keeping the tension is very annoying psychologically for your opponents when you're keeping all three of those options open. Okay, so I think we touched on a number of important topics. So uh, undefended pieces, uh, autopilot moves, trying to always have a plan in mind, especially after castling, uh, time management, especially not playing too quickly, 
gaining space, not feeling like you always have to force things and play as directly as possible, uh, and also tension, using tension to your advantage. So hopefully that was helpful to you guys. Yes. And thanks again to the Oslo Chess Festival. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Yep. Any questions for John? No? Any, anyone? No? Yes. Yes, yeah, so I'll be playing in Stavanger a uh, few days after this. I still got to figure out how I'm going to get there, <laughs> but I'll figure that out. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the old sports cliche and just say I'm going to take it a game <laughs> at a time. <laughs> it's so hard with uh, especially open tournaments where you don't know what score you're going to need for a... Uh, I assume you're talking about a norm or maybe just general expectations, but uh, I'm trying to play longer tournaments to get norms. And for norms, I think you just got to play well at the beginning of the tournament and hopefully exploit your chances later when push comes to shove in the later rounds. But really, I'm just trying to get better every single game that I play, regardless of who my opponent is. Doing all these this videos, is that something you do to make a living or is it something that actually benefits your chess? Uh, actually, I was kind of talking about that with uh, Kimya a little bit, but... I don't think it benefits my my play so much, but it's definitely made me a better teacher, mm, mm. like unquestionably. Mm. And I started making videos originally because I wanted some practice. I noticed I wasn't playing online all that much and, mm. and really practicing because I was teaching so much. I, mm. I do chess professionally, so I mostly teach. Um, so I, I made the YouTube channel and started posting videos to force myself to be held accountable. Mm. Um, you know, if I'm going to explain my thoughts and put my analysis out there, I want it mm. to be good. And it's, it's since morphed into something that um, I continues to maybe benefit me slightly in my play, but I think it more so mm. helps me as a teacher. Mm. Right. Any other questions? Yes. Will you post videos to YouTube channel on your website any time this week? Hopefully, eventually. Yeah. Yeah, I hope to do so. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that requires a bit of planning just to get the angle right. And uh, I was lucky in that London tournament, that uh, the club that I was playing at, they had everything set up in advance. I didn't even know about that until I got there, but they had like a professional camera set up, positioned perfectly to record the game. As you probably know, like mm. recording a chess game, even though it seems simple, to get the angle right, and the lighting and whatnot actually takes right. some, some foresight. So probably not on this trip, but uh, it's definitely something I always, I always like to do if it's available. Any other plans for your YouTube channel that you want to do that you haven't done? No, not especially. I want to play some more matches, I think. Right. I like playing dual commentaries with other streamers. And I think over the next few years, we're going to see more and more people streaming, especially mm -hmm. top players. You can already see that like with mm -hmm. the Karu Nakamura on mm -hmm. chess.com. I'm honestly surprised that more people in the chess community haven't posted mm. and opened YouTube channels, open Twitch channels. I think we're lagging behind a bit mm. compared to uh, eSports, yes. e for instance. So I, I hope to see more of that. Well, well, mm -hmm. Yeah, you first. Uh, long term, yes, but probably not anytime soon just because it is resource intensive. Yeah. What kind of videos do you get the most feedback uh, on? Like, what, kind of, what are the videos that are most popular that you make? Ah, good question. Uh, I would say the, the purely instructional ones. So I have a couple series that have been very, very popular. Mm. Uh, one is called Chess Fundamentals, where I go over kind of themes like this. In fact, the first Chess Fundamentals video was on loose pieces, undefended pieces. So there's a series of videos there. I think uh, I've created... I forgot, maybe seven videos or something in that series. I also have a series called Climbing the Rating Ladder, where I play players from different rating categories, like all the way down to sub-1,000 players, all the way up to like 2,000. And people really, really like those, like seeing the difference in strength. Because, mm. um, again, I, I'm always kind of hesitant to show stuff like this because I don't want to give the impression that I'm pumping up my play to be more uh, than it is. But you can really see thematic... Uh, ideas in chess when there is a rating mismatch. Like, mm. that's where you see the textbook things come to light. Whereas when it's, like, two GMs going at against each other, it often just boils down to, like, the minutia. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, the, the chess fundamentals and the climbing the rating ladder videos are probably the mm. ones I've got the most feedback on. And if you're interested in my channel, those would be the ones I'd recommend to start. Y you're obviously a, a very good teacher. Did you ever consider writing a book? 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've actually got an offer or two in the past to write oh, books. Oh. And um, yeah, I, I would do it if the project was right. It probably wouldn't be an opening book hmm. unless it was like an opening that was near and dear to me, like the Scandinavian defense. Um, but yeah, it's, I'd probably much rather write it on something like general improvement related. S so we can expect a book from you. That sounds <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> Maybe in like half a decade or yeah, something. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, and getting uh, getting the grandmaster title like you, you missed the norm here is, is, would that be a big deal for you? Yeah, definitely. That yeah. would be the the culmination of yeah. a lot of uh, chess work and a lifelong goal. So yeah. you I seem hope to, to have the it. you seem to have the strength. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, clearly. Even yeah. though you missed it up barely here, hopefully, uh, especially if you win tomorrow, I guess. Yeah, I always I always feel like I'm very competitive in these um, these tournaments that I play against even against GM opponents. Mm -hmm. I've been. And I am for 10 plus years now. Mm. I think I got my IM title in 2006. Mm. So it's been a while. It's just, uh, I think the major thing when you're chasing norms mm. is to consistently play. Right. And in the past, I've been playing a, a nine round tournament once every three or four months. And at some point, it just came clear, became clear to me that that wasn't going to cut mm. it. I need to mm. play more often and mm. truly get in OTB shape. And after Stavanger, then, then where, are you going? where are you going? Are you going home? So I'm playing, a, yeah, I'm going home and I'm playing a tournament in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, in late November. Mm. So that's my next norm tournament that I have on the calendar. Mm. Hopefully I'll play uh, a few other tournaments before the end of the year too. Mm. Yeah. So uh, I think that's that's it. Uh, very good. Yeah, uh, Paul has one question. Yeah, when are you coming back to our program? Hopefully next <laughs> year. Yeah, if it works out, I'd love to come back next year. That was a great uh, hour of... Uh, Chess, uh, wish you the best of luck tomorrow and especially in Stavanger. Thank you. Uh, turn into uh, John's YouTube channel. Uh, what's the name of it? It's just my name, John Bartholomew. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for that. Yep. Thanks, guys.